Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andy Christensen. I'm happy to be here moderating today's webinar on the intersection of medical of art and medical 3D printing. Uh, we're really, really pleased to have with us uh, two uh, great speakers from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Jonathan Morris and Christian Hansen. Um, the RSNA special, uh, 3D Printing Special Interest Group is pleased to uh, host today's webinar. A little bit about RSNA, many of you would already know, but the uh, Radiological Society of North America is a uh, nonprofit organization with 50,000 plus members in many countries around the world focused on radiology and uh, education and pushing things forward. The 3D Printing Special Interest Group uh, was started uh, in 2016, and its focus is to uh, promote uh, education, collaboration, and research of medical 3D printing uh, in a point of care uh, setting. Uh, there's more information below on becoming a member. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, if you are an RSNA member, you can join the SIG by, uh, by paying a small additional fee. And if you're not an RSNA member, the RSNAs, uh, created a pathway for you to join uh, specifically to be part of the special interest group. So we would encourage you to do that. I'm here today uh, representing the whole uh, SIG leadership team, uh, which includes Dr. Nicole Wake, uh, Dr. Lumari Santiago, Dr. Beth Ripley, and Dr. Kenneth Wang. A little fun fact is that Dr. Jonathan Morris is a past SIG chair, I think from 2017, something like that. Thank you, Dr. Morris. <laughs> uh, this year, just to give you a little bit of information, if you're not familiar with the SIG, these are some of our kind of practical goals this year. I'll just focus on a couple of them. Uh, we are working hard trying to work on, on the bigger problem or the bigger opportunity, I'd say, for reimbursement. So in the future, uh, we hope that there will be you know, better reimbursement for 3D printed uh, anatomic models and surgical guides. Uh, in that, the, uh, the group has worked with the American College of Radiology in establishing Category 3 CPT codes, and we work toward uh, progressing that uh, into uh, permanent Category 1 CPT codes at some point in the future. The registry is uh, collecting data in support of that effort, and if you're not familiar, uh, this is an RSNA ACR 3D printing registry. Uh, that is facilitated by ACR's Near Deer program. Uh, more information uh, through, uh, if you go through our, our website uh, for the SIG, you can find information on the registry. Another one I'd point out is, is guidelines documents. So the group has worked very hard over, over the last, uh, you know, five plus years on creating appropriateness documents kind of for, uh, for guidelines for 3D printing, uh, looking at clinical efficacy and the literature and expert opinion to help guide uh, appropriate use of these uh, anatomic models and surgical guides. So we hope you can join us. If you're not a member of the SIG, consider that. Uh, we also, one other uh, uh, programming note, uh, this year at RSNA 2022, the annual meeting that's held in Chicago every year, late November, early December, uh, the 3D printing SIG will host a symposium on Thursday, December 1st from noon to four. Uh, registration is complimentary, uh, although you must be registered for RSNA to register. So there's a link there for more information about the program and signing up. So we hope you'll join us for, uh, for an interactive and uh, educational afternoon, uh, December 1st. So uh, we'll move forward. I'll talk a little bit about um, introducing uh, Christian Hansen and Dr. Jonathan Morris. Today's format will include uh, 45 minutes of of uh, talking and, uh, and uh, presentations, followed by 15 minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, I would say as we go, uh, why don't you put those questions in the Q&A section or the chat section, and we will uh, tackle those at the end. Uh, so we're really pleased to have uh, two pioneers in this in this area joined today to talk about the intersection of art and medical 3D printing. Uh, Christian Hansen is, uh, is a, uh, an anatomic modeling in the anatomic modeling unit at Mayo Clinic and uh, is a simulation engineer with a very interesting background that I'm sure he will get into um, as we go. And Dr. Jonathan Morris, many of you would know, uh, is not only the, uh, the head of uh, a Mayo Clinic's anatomic modeling unit and has been a, a stalwart uh, uh, person pushing forward this area for many years. He also uh, is a practicing neuroradiologist and interventional spine um, guy and, uh, and a great guy overall. So I'm happy to welcome you both here. I think Dr. Morris, you will, uh, 
you will go ahead and take the screen and we'll move forward. Thank you again. Okay, I'm gonna launch my slideshow. Sorry, launch my slideshow. Yes. Can you see the slideshow okay? Yep, great. So I'm going to try and keep my part brief. I know that's difficult for me, as many of you know me. Um, I will echo Andy. If you're making 3D printed models in a clinical environment, put them in the registry. We really need to get to category one codes. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a convergence of everything we do, um, including what Christian now does and, and why we would need a special effects artist. So we'll talk a little bit about repurposing anatomic data. Um, why would you need a special effects engineer? And now to have one, I think everyone needs one. Um, design, kind of talk about the multidisciplinary environment he works in. He'll discuss the skill sets and what happens when you combine all of this together which I think is gonna be the most interesting. I just wanna remind people, if you're new to 3D printing and you're not an advanced user, and you say, can I do X? How much does it cost? How long does it take? One printer doesn't do it all. So we have printers that print in clear, we have printers that print in color, photorealistic color. We have flexible printers for education and simulation and landing stents and teaching residents and interventional bronchoscopy courses and aortic stent courses. Um, Sometimes you need sterilizable, which is not germane to this discussion, but we do have sterilizable capabilities. And then ultimately there's even metal, which won't, won't be talked about at all here either, but we do um, use 3D printed metal and we are developing our own titanium manufacturing facility, which leads you to have a whole lot of different printers and they all do something very different. And you can start though with a little, an Ultimaker or a Formlabs or something to start. The key is to just start. And you don't need much to start. You know, you can be in the sub ten thousand uh, dollar, five thousand dollar range, and be in the game for medical education. Um, all of these have a problem with support material that has to be removed, um, whether it's scaffolds or powder or lye baths or water jetting, because these are education models we made before Christian. These are things that we use to tie pig carts in and put lungs in and teach around the world in different nations how to teach people how to do thoroscopic surgeries. So we have been doing um, 3D printed educational simulator trainers for a long time, basically since 17 years ago when we started. Um, so you need stuff to get rid of all that post-processing equipment, which is other stuff. But again, you don't have to start but you, but here, but these are all the things we have to have to do what we're gonna show you. Now we have three main functions in our lab. One is anatomic modeling. We do a few thousand models or a couple thousand models a year. Not a couple thousand patients, but models. So each patient might have three models. And it helps our surgeons take on complex patients and do preoperative planning. We do a lot of guides for cranial maxillofacial and orthopedic reconstruction. And finally, out the back end of our lab, we do a ton of education. So we're not formally in patient education, but we are a big part of the educational seat of the shield. We have about 10,000 square feet of simulation space. We just opened 6,000 square feet of point of care manufacturing, or sorry, point of care education space for procedural skills in the hospital, as well as another 4,000 for nursing um, skills training in the hospital. And we are essentially the maker space for every radiology, or sorry, every ACGME residency, those centers, as well as everything else you can imagine. Um, development needs something, other people need things. We, we're generally the go-to people. Um, and I think early on, we really started to think, okay, yes, we're making anatomic models, but that's just one thing. And one thing with one person. And we really tried to think bigger and say, we have this capability, how can we increase the circularity of the bottle by decreasing waste, by building open infrastructure? So someone just asked before I got this call, how much will this cost? And I said, nothing to you. We're an open door, you come with problems, we solve clinical or education problems, and we designed it at a high enough administrative level where that's our mission. The return on investment is better patient care, better education, and since 70% of our staff come to, um, come to work here from our education programs, it all works out. So, um, so I build a system that's kind of like this. We have medical knowledge across each surgical and medical subspecialty. We have a 3D printing ecosystem that's open to all. 
Now we have a special effects ecosystem, which leads to a product, something, right? And to minimize waste of all that time, we repair it, we reuse it, we remanufacture it, we recycle. So if we make a chest trainer, it's made for the interventional uh, pulmonary team, the ultrasound team, the thoracic surgery team, the med school. We don't make for one. We make for the vision of we're gonna make for all. So when that thing is made, we're already thinking, how is this gonna live in an education shield, right? We have three shields, one's education, one's research, one's clinical. So there, um, Alan and Amy Alexander, who you know is now in the department of engineering, they have an additive manufacturing facility that does a lot of research with titanium and polymers and long-term projects. Whereas we collaborate together, but our printers are mostly for clinical use. If you don't know it already, um, Mayo Clinic is one of the largest single medical education enterprises in the country. It has the largest collection of ACGME trainees in this country and abroad. Um, and we do a fair amount of education under that shield. So we do patient education. Every model is used for patient education, both as a clinical case, but sometimes we just print like fibular free flap models to educate patients. Um, we, we educate each other so that we use the education to educate colleagues uh, between us and the complex anatomy of a patient. We educate our whole team with a similar model. Finally, we do things where we educate the patient in virtual environments. So this is a patient of ours on the table that we, we retro-engineered this room to put this little girl in up on the gonda floor. That's gonna require digital artists, special effects engineers in the digital world to do rigging, lighting, um, construction. We need all of that people besides physical um, simulation. We do augmented reality patient education. So we've been creating this augmented reality mirror system, but the things we put in that mirror system, which come from radiographic data, which are then added onto um, is done digitally and never made into a physical product, but then projected onto the patient. Um, to do some of that, we need people who know how to do something called texture mapping, which is a illustration. It's a, it's a, um, a medical illustration or anybody who works in 3D CAD for architecture or gaming has to texture map their thing. So when we take a spine that we made for a clinical model, we then add anatomy to it. We clean it up in ZBrush. We then do something called UV mapping, which Christian will show a video of. We then add texture to it, both for the digital world, but also for the physical world. So if I want to make something like this, where we have augmented reality of a physical object based on tracking on any phone or tablet. Well, I need someone to texture map that. I need someone to code this. I need a whole group of people to be able to make this a reality. And those people all live in the same physical location where you interact. So when I need texture mapping, Christian can help. When I need coding, our VR engineer can help. When I need medical illustration, our medical illustrator can help. Um, and this is all from a patient data set that was used for surgical planning, but we repurpose and we reuse it in these settings. Now we do a fair amount of simulation and a lot of it's ultrasound guided. So creating ultrasound guided self-healing ballistic gel type of materials, that's complex. And it requires somebody with that skill set specifically, because we're just not making this one off. We're doing the CRNA school. We're doing the pain. Um, center. We're doing orthopedic um, models with ultrasoundable guided elbow surgery. We're doing pediatric emergency respiratory, and we're doing emergency room joint drainages. So anything we create, yes, this is a thing, but that thing has to come from a pipeline. And that pipeline has to have a big enough vision where we have to feed everyone. It's just not about the project. Because if an orthopedic surgeon wants to say, can I take this drill bit and can I just take out one part of the electronon in a, in a patient? Yeah, we can simulate that. And when he does it and then says, now I wanna teach 10 other people how to do it. Well, you don't wanna do that on your elbow. So then we'll pr produce paraffin wax embedded things and then Christian can build a housing for it all. So it's in an arm. So now you can teach 10 people, 20 people, 30 people at meetings, all of this. Um, COVID forced our hand to build more simulators because now we had to teach all kinds of people how to do swabs. So we took our anatomic data, opened their mouth, added mucosa, added tonsils, and created things really fast. Like within a week, we had these out in the field to nurses, to people who had to do swabs and know 
where the skull base was and know where the nasopharynx was. Um, we've made simulation models in the past. So that's a CT scan face that you get in every CT scan made on a Stratasys printer for carotid injury during endoscopy scoping. So we have made these type of models in the past, but when you're gonna see what Christian does, this is low fidelity. Yes, it's a huge leap forward, but it's low fidelity. And then we wanna do it for patients. So if this patient comes and the surgeon says, I wanna airway, yep, we can give you airways. The patient has complete rings. They have to do a tracheoplasty on them. But now we have abilities to add those complete rings, 3D print molds that make molds that then make within three days, a patient specific rehearsal simulation tool for, we made three of these for the resident, the fellow, the staff to do the surgery on something that's not 3D printed, but uses 3D printing to get there. We have a lot of employees and at any given time, we have 4,200 learners with 400 programs in five schools. So we have five schools under the College of Medicine. Of course, we have the medical school with two campuses, but we have 400 programs that all feed Mayo Clinic from these other schools. And we have to be able to educate all of those people. So the Mayo brothers used to learn on the patient or from another surgeon overseas. And then we went to the point where we say, no one should learn on the patient. You should learn from an experienced surgeon um, or an experienced educator. The trouble is there's only one person. There's only one experienced educator. Now we have given them a lot of tools, 3D printed cadaver heads, photogrammetry cadaver pieces. All of this is part of the med school curriculum. Um, and we do make all kinds of anatomic excellent models from you know, 0.2 millimeter photon counting CTA scans to teach people about prostatic artery embolization. We do make a lot of that kind of stuff right off the printer. Um, and that has allowed us to teach in all kinds of ways, to hold infant spines in our hands, to teach people ligaments of the wrist, even before we get to um, what we're gonna talk about, right? We're already doing all kinds of amazing education in this space, but that has to live, and don't read this slide, that has to live in an incredibly complex environment across live and recorded videos and stuff that are gonna go right to the patient in a cadaveric tissue course, in immersive environments, hands-on courses. So like the problem with, with what we have right now in medicine is this person has to teach all these people this. And who's really getting educated today? This was at ASSR 2022, same thing. Who of these people is getting educated? So one of the things we've been driving is a medical XR ecosystem. You know, we're investing millions of dollars right now to set up our medical XR environment with a lot of the content that we've made already. But this is an example, and I'll probably end right after this one, of something that's 3D printing, training, XR, texture mapping, you need it all. If you're gonna replicate this environment, which are respiratory therapists, nurses, vascular surgeons, anesthesiologists, all in a complex environment, not on the schedule, this is costly training. And you can make all the ventilators and ECMO machines in the world, but if you don't have trained people, none of that works. So we've created an ecosystem where first we replicated emergency rooms. We put these people in the room. We replicated all the equipment, the Lucas Automatic um, Compression Device, the TEE probes. We replicated anatomy. That needed an artist. Lucas did not give us the 3D CAD files. I need a hard surface artist that can then replicate everything in this room light it, make it interactive, and then teach people anatomy, teach people physiology, teach people cell dinger technique of cannulation, all in an immersive environment in a way that before they come to that hands-on training, they've already gone through every step of putting somebody on VA ECMO. We don't want to take apart the simulation part though, because we make low cost 3D printed cannulation models. Everything doesn't have to be super high fidelity. This is low cost Ultimaker cannulation models that we teach at ECMO courses around the country. Um, finally, I'll show one more example and then hit up Christian. Um, we do a lot of skull based tumors in Mayo and we, therefore we do 3D printing of a lot of skull based tumors, but these cases like hemangioblastomas, super vascular tumor, right? They're really vascular tumors. You don't want to be anywhere inside this tumor. It's a blood bath. You can't embolize it preoperatively. There's too much blood flow to it. So you have to take it out around the vessel. So we do make 3D printed models out of our skull-based 
combining rotational angiograms and CT scans. But what else should you do with this, right? Well, we run skull-based anatomy courses. So it's not just used in the OR, but then I need to take that skull, take that tumor, have a pipeline of texture mapping so that I can get it in this space. So that when we're teaching people endoscopic skull-based approaches, this is a far lateral approach, um, and which is a, you know, a modification of a suboccipital approach, but, and I want them to see the tumor, the vascular supply, the nerve orientation, and have it look more realistic in a VR environment. Well, I need coders, digital artists, texture mappers, lighting, riggers. Um, I need some engineering. We need training people to design. This is all made in house. There's not a single part of this that was made out of house. Um, when that's what happens when you have this ecosystem. All right, last thing I promise, um, because this is an important part of it. Some of what we do doesn't take a digital artist. Like if I want to replicate this kidney, we have been surface scanning for six years um, of pathologic tissue, myself and Dr. Joe Malachewski in pathology. But we had to create a pipeline where somebody with a high school diploma and or uh, associate's degree can take a brain we give them, put it in a box, press the button, and never, we don't ever want to hear the word point cloud, mesh, any of that. We want take your brain out, put brain in box, and I want the brain on my phone, VR, AR, or physically replicated. So we built this infrastructure of 3D capture of anatomy, pathology, autopsy. And we have three of these boxes. Two are in right now, um, and we have a third going in frozen section to create content that has to live on any device to any person anywhere in the world. So if you hold up your phone on camera mode, and point it at that QR code, you will get a left ventricular aneurysm and you can go ahead and do it. You will get that left ventricular aneurysm in 3D on your phone, regardless of device. So we're doing things otherwise too, to not just use the artist, but also use the real tissue to put it on your device. So I'm gonna end there um, and thank you. And I'll turn it over to Christian. Hello, everyone. Let me just grab my, make sure I have the right screen. Let's see, everyone's seeing my page okay? So yeah, um, thanks for joining us. I'm Christian Hansen. I'm a simulation engineer here at the Mayo Clinic Anatomic Modeling Unit. Sometimes we call it the modeling lab. And uh, so a little bit about, let's see my background. So I was a kid who was obsessed with monsters and all weird things like that. And uh, that led me from being a, a fan of things like that to a professional artist. I learned sculpture, painting, all the skills uh, that are needed to make these kinds of things um, as a hobbyist, really. Um, and my education is from uh, monster magazines, books I found at the library on three-dimensional makeup, how to make masks, how to make models. Um, most people who do makeup effects and fabricate props and things like this um, are mostly self-taught. Most of the people who are really good out there who do movie effects uh, learn from magazines like this, from what looks like kid stuff, but is actually filled with all sorts of technical information on mold making and painting, different materials, so part of the, the craft and the culture of people who are into creature effects, movie makeup, et cetera, um, lots of technical skills. So you have uh, very hyper-realistic sculpture. I mean, we really aspire to create things that look as real as possible with materials. Um, so one has to learn generally sculpture, fine art sculpture, fantasy sculpture, character design. Um, and then there's a lot of technical uh, processes that are involved. So you have uh, all kinds of mold making, casting, fabrication, different materials, uh, and then painting work. So a special effects artist, you know, people do specialize, but generally one will learn all of these different skills uh, in order to make a makeup or a prop or what have you, whatever's needed to create some sort of an illusion. 
uh, I have done some film work uh, using these skills. I've been based in the Midwest, so I've had a few things uh, in some bigger films and a lot of low budget films. Um, you can see there, did some background masks for one of the Resident Evil movies, did uh, a very gory crushed head for the Wrong Turn film that came out last year. Um, so there's lot, lots, of, uh, lots of demand for this kind of work still in the CG era. Uh, this is an example of a project that I worked on with a, a team here in, in Minnesota on a low budget film called The Harbinger. And what I want to stress here is that people who work in this field uh, work, it's very collaborative. Um, so there you can see in the lower corner, I'm working with my colleague, Ryan Shadley. Uh, we both were sculpting this body suit along with the owner of the studio, Chris Ballas. Um, so very rarely do we own one of these pieces completely. I did a lot of the scale texturing. Ryan did a lot of the design of the chest. Chris did a lot of the sculpture work, sculpted the face. So it's, it's a collaborative culture that makeup effects people uh, come from. Uh, I also spent about 10 years doing museum exhibits sort of as my day job where I learned how to work in epoxy resins, which is a, a rigid material. So these, both of these examples are of animal sculptures that are, are rigid um, and painted to look like fur. So again, another application of my painting and sculpture skills to create the illusion, something that uh, museum exhibits have to be very durable. So we always had to make things what we called bomb proof. So often we couldn't use fur, we'd have to use rigid epoxies and paint. Here's a few more examples of the, the variety of work I did. And I think this is also representative of what a lot of film effects people end up doing too. Uh, you rarely specialize in something like sculpting faces or bats or you know, particulars. It's everything. It could be a three foot dragonfly like that model. It could be portrait sculptures like you see there. Uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, wide variety of subject matter that uh, Generally, most fabrication artists, but especially special effects artists, have to cover. That then led uh, about 2015 into the world of medical simulation, where now I'm getting closer to doing the type, type of work that I did uh, for film and the makeup effects type work, um, but for uh, medical training needs. So here is uh, a couple of products that I worked again with a team uh, to create where I sculpted uh, the faces, of both of these intubation mannequin uh, silicone skins, did a lot of mold design. But again, I had a team of people that I worked with. Uh, we would critique one another's work, uh, share ideas. One person would be molding while another one was sculpting. And also the this brought in a, more of the engineering needs of products like this that aren't just going to be shown once and filmed or put on display in a museum, but this is something that's going to be, people are going to be interacting with and it's going to have to move and, and all the requirements that a realistic simulation model has. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out about this is this though, when I was working and I was working as a independent contractor with this company, um, we didn't have radiology imaging data. We didn't have patient data to work from. So this is a project uh, where I had to hand create out of wax tubing, a bronchial, the core of a bronchial tree, um, looking at reference material to get the proportions correct and the branching. And so this was all done by hand to make what you see on the lower left, um, a silicone cast that one could put a bronchoscope through to navigate and teach someone the the architecture of the, the bronchial uh, anatomy. So just generally um, about what special effects artists do, sculpture is something I mentioned before, but it really is the foundation of anyone who's creating illusions and physical illusions and models or makeup or what have you. So that's one of the subjects that I personally have focused on through 20 some years of doing this work. Here's a portrait I worked on of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
And you can just see, obviously, the, the level of reference material that I would use to, tr to capture this likeness. Uh, I got as many pictures as I could. And that's the sort of attitude that affects people have toward capturing reality. A couple pictures isn't enough. I mean, we want to get it as close as humanly possible. So I studied portraiture. I, I learned uh, most of my focus was on, on the human face, and which is, I think, the most difficult subject to master. So there's a, some of the portraiture work that I did, uh, some of that for museums, some as model kits. And uh, you learn a lot trying to replicate a person's face. Uh, special effects artists also, because of primarily because of prosthetic makeup, uh, we focus on detail to the finest degree possible. So this example um, of the lips, I mean, that's all hand sculpted in a oil-based clay. Um, so it's kind of part of the culture. This is the level that the effects world uh, just takes as takes for granted as a standard. So another skill that makeup effects people have is life casting. So life casting is the process by which one is making a copy of often a face for makeup, but it could be anything. Um, making a copy with an alginate material, which is a water-based impression material that's often used to make teeth impressions or was before scanning became dominant. Um, it's the same with face uh, casting as well, that that's, that's really, starting to get taken over by scanning, but there's still a need for doing life casts uh, where an impression material is placed. Uh, you can see in the lower left corner, a uh, plaster bandage shell is created to hold the shape of that impression material and then plaster or some other material is put into that. So basically making a mold of the face that you can then make pieces that will fit precisely to an actor. Um, sometimes it's making a duplicate uh, to create fake body parts or a fake head or something. So here's Ryan Shally and I, I was helping him out on a project he had where we did this full head cast of a young actress. And, and of course you can see there, I, we can do arms, people do full body casts. And then this is a result. So we have a plaster cast that he used to do makeup uh, from that. And then also made a clay copy of her head to create a fake head for a film project he was working on and that's a so the brown material is a clay a meltable clay that was poured into the mold mold making's a, a major part of this type of work um, so and there's a wide variety of techniques and it depends on the type of cast that one is going to make i have uh you can see there in the lower left uh, that is a a model of a bat that I've started the mold. So the, the brown material there is a water clay that I've used as a dividing wall. So when that's filled with a silicone molding material, uh, that can be cleaned off, the model is left in the mold, and then the second half is poured. So one of the keys of making molds is you have to get the original material out and you're going to have to get the thing you cast out of that mold. So there's a lot of engineering involved in designing how to both remove the cast material, but also um, how to get the material into the mold. And part of you know casting is knowing uh, the wide variety of materials that are out there. So we tend to use lots of different silicones, but there's also different plastic materials, urethanes um, come in a wide variety, tintable urethanes, different hardnesses, um, clear urethanes. So um, a lot of the molds will be designed for the particular material that one is gonna cast uh, in. And having that experience and having lots of projects helps one to determine the best approach to doing this. And it's a lot of learning as you go. Uh, we also uh, work with a lot of latex materials. Uh, most makeups in the past were made with a foamed latex. So it had a very uh, pliable, stretchy um, quality. It's not used quite as much any, anymore. Most uh, makeup has turned to uh, silicone prosthetics with a gel. 
Um, there's also gel to Dr. Morris mentioned earlier. Uh, ballistics gels are used a lot in simulation for ultrasound. And uh, again, it has its own demands and requirements. Here's an example of an eye I had made in the past with a clear urethane. So again, to create an illusion of something like an eye, it's a matter of creating, designing molds, designing parts, painting, attaching a, a, a thread material for the, these blood vessels, and then registering that into a mold to create a clear urethane shell uh, for the exterior. So it's a, it's a complex process to create something that looks realistic like that. And one has to be steeped in all these materials, mold making, painting, all these skills to pull something like this off. Also silicone has its own demands for painting. So this is a project which I, I'll detail at the end of my talk um, of a silicone skin that was sculpted. And so this is all silicone paint uh, you can't use any other paint on silicone materials. It'll just rub right off. Silicone doesn't bond to other uh, synthetic materials. It, it really only bonds to itself. So silicone has to be thinned down, tinted, and then spattered here or airbrushed on. Um, sometimes it's a hand brush. There's all kinds of techniques. But every material has its own requirement of what, uh, what can be used to, to get paint on it, to color it. This is another example of an anastomosis trainer I worked on here. Again, silicone painted with silicone. Uh, here's some masks that I made, a uh, whole nother process. Uh, so not only does one need to know how, how to paint, how to add color in a subtle way, but also to, uh, to use all these different materials. So this was a latex material. I painted these in years ago. This was for uh, Stephen King there with, for his radio station years ago. And then uh, again, this is some of the work I did creating a replica of a California condor. And that is a rigid sculpture of fiberglass uh, epoxies and urethane resin and whole different matter of how to paint that, whole different materials. So again, wide variety. People with my background have a wide variety of technical skills and materials, knowledge and techniques on how to use those in the proper context. A, few, a year and a half ago, I started at Mayo Clinic and started to branch out more into uh, using these skills in the digital world. So digital sculpting is a major requirement of working with anatomic models. So here is something, a close-up of a, a model of a lung that was shrunk down, that all that detail is sculpted in the software. Uh, that's kind of an industry standard for digital sculpting called ZBrush. So instead of working with a material, now I'm working with a mesh and learning to manipulate the mesh how to get it to do uh, what I artistically want it to do uh, has been a challenge, but it's also a, a great asset for um, having the freedom to do whatever we need to to the models that we start off with. And here you can see, again, it's a, the mesh of this collapsed lung model where all that texture, all that surface detail was added uh, sculpturally in the computer. Another good example is this is an infant for a trainer I have been developing. Patient scan data, raw data here, and it needs to be cleaned up because we, we don't want to have the artifacts of, uh, you know, the putting the pacifier in and so forth for the scan. So sculpturally, I can go in in ZBrush and re-sculpt the lips, take away any of the impressions from a fixation uh, you know, strap or what have you, um, for the model. So we have, uh, we start off kind of with a digital life cast almost, um, from the CT data. And I can now manipulate that to what we need for our educational needs and to make a nice, clean, professional, uh, model for a mannequin. So once I have these silicone models sculpted now to get them out of the digital world back into the real world. I, again, I'm going to mold making, but now I have, I had to develop a way to make molds in the digital world. 
So ZBrush has a lot of tools, a lot of features that allow me to do virtually what I was doing in the physical world with plasters and silicones and clays or uh, fiberglass really to make molds of these sculptures. So here you can see that I've got the, the interior, which will be the hollow part of this piece uh, is from the patient uh, CT data from the, their skull, which I've manipulated to get rid of hollow areas and so on. So I get a nice smooth interior and the interior is that digital sculpture, but now made in reverse as a sheet, as a mold that goes together. There's objects on there that are registration keys uh, to, so that all the parts fit together perfectly. And then once we fill that with silicone, we have a cast of that sculpture that will fit exactly on the structure of the, the printed skull that is part of this mannequin that we're developing. Other parts, same thing. We'll, I'll do some manipulation in ZBrush. I close the fist on this one, for example. This is from a model that we acquired, I think. And uh, I finished so finish the sculpture, design the mold. We 3D print the molds and fill with silicone. And that's how we can create a full mannequin. It's another example. This is a uh, surface skin for a thoracotomy trainer that I'm working on. Again, I did the sculpture of the skin, starting with patient data, uh, manipulated it to create the exposure, uh, designed the four-part mold so that would fit within our printer's limited build capacity, um, and then printed these parts. Another example of 3D printed mold is this ENT model, which is kind of the next version of the one that Dr. Morris had shown. We're using the patient data and we're creating an accurate silicone skin that fits over another part that's designed that has the, the skull and the nasal anatomy and so on. So then the next uh, feature is how to get color on models. Now we do have some full color printers. So um, when I saw some of the, the pathology models being printed in full color, I thought, well, there must be a way for me to be able to paint virtually a model and then print it full color. So this is kind of the, the biggest uh, attempt at that so far. So this is the interior of this uh, thoracic cavity. Can see the heart there it's somewhat abstract but so i not only do i have to design the part but then there's remeshing the interior so i can break this apart and make it so uh, we can print full color on top of that that model to the way i want it to look so this is that mesh that's been flattened out so this is what UV unwrapping is without getting too into it. It's essentially taking a 3D model, distinguishing or defining parts of it that, for example, in this case, I wanted one side to be printed in full color. The other side uh, was all going to be white. It wasn't going to be seen by the user. So I was able to, in ZBrush, flatten the, this mesh out into these islands by separating them by defining all of these parts and then shrinking those islands down that I didn't need and expanding the ones I do need. And what that does is that gives me more area because what this is going to translate into is a flat uh, kind of like a JPEG or a, a Photoshop document. It's going to be the color image is going to end up being flat and then reapplied when we go to print it. So here's a, a good example of of how that works. So here's the model finished painted. And there's the UV unwrapping. So you can see how that will then be applied uh, to the three dimensional model, but it's, it's source material is a flat image like this. And so here's the full design of that, that thoracotomy trainer. Um, this is all done digitally. There's all sorts of elements. We have a low cost uh, FDM print for the, the gray body, the, the general form for this. You can see this, the surface skin where we made, I made the mold and cast that in silicone. 
the lung, the collapsed lung is also a silicone piece. There's the aorta, which is another part that was molded and cast in silicone. And then the thoracic shell, thoracic cavity with the heart, that's all from that 3D printed full color unwrapped part. And, and this morning we took it out of the printer and that's what it looks like just after the supports are cleared off. So that's all painted and that's all done in ZBrush and exported and printed full color on a Stratasys J750 full color printer. Another example is uh, some eyes I was working on where I was able to take a fo that photograph of an iris and apply it to the iris of the model and print it full color. So what you're seeing there is something that um, was taken from a photo that I basically I found online. So this is a test and, and applied to a, an eye model and printed. So we're able to take photographic images and apply them. And if we set the model up correctly with the UV unwrapping and all this technical mesh stuff, <laughs> um, we can have a full color print, which is something that would be very difficult to do in the, the regular world. Another thing we use 3D printing for is to create the structures. So you saw in the earlier example of where uh, the, the shell that would hold the silicone parts is 3D printed. Um, in this case, a little bit more advanced, I've created a, a whole posable armature from this infant skeleton, manip you know, uh, changing it so it's easy to print and it's a simple mechanism but this will all be covered in silicone pieces and be used as a pneumothorax trainer. So to get into, uh, let's see how much time I've, I think I've got plenty of time. Um, so this is a more in depth look at one of the models that is a really good example of a mix of 3D printing and design with uh, traditional sculpting and mold making techniques. This is a deep flap uh, anastomosis trainer. So we start with uh, patient data. So in order for me to build the different layers of this model, um, it's a really great resource. I kind of can start with, again, it's almost as if I'm getting a, not just a cast of the person's exterior, but their rib cage and the anatomy that's relevant to the model. So I start off generally with patient data. I break it down, start to figure out how the pieces are going to go together as physical objects, and then do kind of a rough design in ZBrush in the computer. So I'm starting to figure out what part will be 3D printed support structures, which pieces are going to be um, visible or interacted with that need to be uh, silicone and realistic. And then I end up with my final design. So this is an exploded view where you can see on the left side, this is the low cost FDM printed support structure. You know, there's no reason to have a full rib cage or have um, anything but basically like a form that all the silicone pieces can sit on. Uh, this also has to support the part of the ribs that are visible. So. You know, a big part of what I do, and, and this is somewhat similar to my effects background, is, is sort of the engineering of how to get all these pieces to fit together in an efficient way. So not only can you build it, but also there's sort of the, there's the illusion from the user's point of view that this is reality. And so again, here's a 360 view of the final design. So at this point, I really haven't built anything physically. Um, and I, but I've defined which parts are going to be 3D printed, which ones I'm going to sculpt. So for example, I, I didn't really go into a lot of detail on the uh, fat flaps or the uh, surface skin um, because I know I'm going to do that all physically in clay. Um, but it's, it's a good sketch sort of so I could work with the surgeon and we can discuss if there's any thing that needs to be changed or if this is the way to go. Uh, and once I get approval, then I go to the next step of starting to print elements and get things ready for sculpting.
so here's the base and ribs. And I originally had an armature for the, the flaps. Um, this would be all 3D printed. So I finalized those parts. I have a little post there for uh, a biotubing material that is what's really what's used to practice uh, suturing these vessels together. So I have to, again, I have to design not just for the artistry, but for the, the practical elements of how do you build this thing? How do you put it all together? And doing these things virtually is, is really helpful for that. So here we are uh, printing parts of that base, printed it in four parts because you can see the size of the printing you know, bed. Uh, we don't have a gigantic FDM printer and it's just as fine because uh, I can just divide everything up and bolt it together since it's not a, a, a visually focused element of the model. We also uh, scan some retractors, printed those. It's easier to scan and print them than to try to acquire real ones. So there's lots of different 3D printing technologies used in a trainer like this. Now, from that, I need to make a physical mold. So in order to sculpt this, to create a realistic skin to sit on top of this structure, I had to make a copy of that form altogether that then I could make a epoxy and fiberglass base, which will end up being part of the final mold that I could sculpt the piece to. So what you see here is an exact copy physically of the, all those 3D printed parts put together. And what that allows me to do is have a, a perfect fit of the sculpture that I'm making to this piece. And this is all stuff I learned doing prosthetics for makeup. So the sculpting process, I use an oil-based clay. It's called monster clay, but there's lots of different clays. Uh, it doesn't use, have water or anything in it, so it doesn't dry out. So I'm working on this over days, potentially weeks, while I'm working on other projects. And it allows me to sort of test out um, how all the pieces are going to fit together before I finalize it. I also got feedback from the surgeon we were working with to do this, um, who's doing this type of a procedure all the time about how, where the retractors are placed, um, what the exposures look like. So having that direct input from the expert uh, helps to get the realism to a level that, you know, expert surgeons are gonna see this and it's then relate to it and say, yeah, that's, that's what we see. And here's the final sculpture. So you can see uh, all of the skin detail, Some of that's done with uh, a device that rolls a texture on. A lot of it's done by hand. And trying to create that illusion that this is a uh, reality. This is a real patient with the, the tension in the skin, the wrinkles. That's all from my background as a makeup effects person, to create, trying to create an illusion of reality of tissue. So the next step is to mold this sculpture. So I coat it in an epoxy material. And then after that, a fiberglass. So it's a very lightweight, strong mold that can be used, used for years, make duplicates. The flaps were made out of a brushable silicone, a little bit less involved process. Okay, and then, so now we have a mold. So the next step is to cast the silicone piece. So I prep the interior with uh, a clear layer of silicone and I can tint the silicone uh, before I paint it. So part of making realistic models like this and silicone pieces is intrinsic coloration. The mold is closed and then the rest of the volume is filled. Uh, basically with gravity, it's, and there's the final cast. 
you can see some of the intrinsic color there. And I had other silicone parts too. So here's the pleurisurface surface with, I think I used three different colors. The flaps, those vessels were intrinsically colored. So now this is just the starting point before I am painting. So here we have a model, it's got color on it, but it doesn't quite have the realism that we want. So the next step for me is painting the silicone. So here I started with some thin washes of silicone brushed on top of the model. So you can see that original intrinsic color. Starting to get looking at lots of references. And then skin is, is uh, takes its own requirements to paint and get realistic. Lots of spattering of color, lots of airbrushing. In the makeup effects world, we go for reality and we go for a certain subtlety. Um, so there's a lot of paint work you almost don't really see exactly. Lots of shading and shadowing. But again, the goal is to create this illusion that that's you know, a real patient. That's a real person's skin. And here's the final piece. And you know, this is the kind of thing that I've put on... Uh, my social media and gets blocked and uh, covered because it's the algorithms read this as a uh, real surgery photos, <laughs> which I kind of take as a testament to uh, a successful piece. And so now someone can practice this procedure in context, you know, dealing with the the structure and the surface. And I think there's also something about the sympathetic uh, realism of a model like this. It really, you know, puts you in as much as possible the setting that you're doing surgery, you're practicing on a real person. And that's the final model again. And you can see there without the covering that the combination of what's needed to be seen as real, and then the 3D printed elements that, uh, that hold that structure together. And that's, that's that for me. Well, that was uh, amazing work, Christian. That's uh, sort of un unbelievable. I mean, merging the two, you know, merging art and obviously having to have an artistic eye and all that you do, but merging that with the digital tools and seeing how they combine is, uh, is awesome. So thank you for sharing that. We have, um, we'll probably run a little long, so uh, understand if people have to uh, jump off, but there are a couple of questions coming in. I had a few, I had 10 or 20 questions myself. Um, first question, uh, let's see. Um, do you add textures to clinical cases or just use those, or just those used for education? Yes, yeah, so maybe I'll take that one. I did want to make a yeah. point that I didn't make earlier. You know, I was inspired by the work of Andrew Hosmer, who was at Boston Sims. This wasn't the first idea to have special effects people in a medical environment. So there are, there, I just want to give a shout out to him because he was really helpful. And um, the other thing that I wanted to say is getting a healthcare environment to get a job description through HR for a special effects engineer is not trivial. So if anybody wants help, uh, it took me a year and a half. Um, but we don't texture map everything. So the latest, uh, ability to do 3D visualization and imaging is Siemens cinematic rendering, which are FBXs, which try and supply lighting to the uh, shading, but we're working on a texture map pipeline so that we can do that for every case. Uh, UV unwrapping is not trivial. We just kind of showed it. It is incredibly complex. And when you have organic structures with internal hollow features, um, softwares do very poorly at it. So um, if you're designing like a game, it's easy to texture map because it's not a hollow object. You're, you're creating it knowing you're going to texture map it. When you do anatomic data, it is uh, <laughs> challenging would be like a light word, but we're trying to get it to where like it's not like that because we do want to texture map everything we need to, but a lot of times we don't. So our surgeons like tumors in green, very easy to see, clear cut. They don't want that hemangioblastoma texture map looking like a tumor. Yeah, 
Yeah, it makes sense. Um, Kristen, I had a question for you, you know, moving from using what I'll call the, you know, the traditional analog kind of tools to using digital tools. What's been the most, I don't know, what's been the most kind of eye opening aspect of that, that that's powerful for you, obviously, having done this for years and done it by hand, doing it by hand digitally, what have you found and what's what's excited you? Uh, there's so much, um, you know, I always have uh a big place for the practical techniques, but uh, some of the things like uh, one, one, I don't have an example of it there, but one thing I was able to do with those trachea models was create a mold to create a mold. So I could 3D print, I could design in ZBrush um, pieces that would I could fill with silicone and then those two silicone pieces would fit together like a traditional two-part silicone mold. So normally, like with that example of the bat, I would take an object, build a clay wall, that would be my separation point for the two halves of the mold. Um, what I'm able to do now virtually is if I have a digital model, I can create that dividing wall with registration keys and what have you, and then I can print each side of that with sort of a wall around it. And once those are printed, I fill those with silicone and then the two silicone pieces fit together and that's my mold. So to be able to do something that's not a direct one piece made from another, but to do it abstractly in the computer, you know, simultaneously is something I've never been able to do before. I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, limitless. Being able to apply a photo to an object and then print that like an iris. So potentially I could see taking a high resolution photo of someone's eye, applying it to an eye model and then printing it full color. Now that's something that, you know, I don't know a way to do that in the practical world. Um, so, yeah. The other thing I would bring up is um, I'm a big fan of co-location and physical presence. And the nice thing about what Christian does is he doesn't have to search out any reference material. Like if we need a neck dissection, I just call down the OR, he puts down scrubs and walks right downstairs and takes pictures and videos. And having that ability to have all the source material like breast trainers were doing or breast mastectomy models we're gonna be doing, all the source material lives inside the hospital and decreasing that barrier to just say, you don't have to wax mold the bronchoscopy tree. We've got a million of them, you know? Um, and the flip side of that is we're building so I, I'm a director of the Biomedical Scientific Visualization Group. We have about 16 medical illustrators. We're building out a group in that group just for 3D um, texture mapping, 3D work, because we're building out a really large XR environment and we can't waste hours every day texture mapping things that are gonna go into that virtual space. Yeah, if I could add yeah. the, the other thing that's I, probably more than anything that's really, uh, you know, been a revelation is the amount of patient data uh, that have access to a full bronchial tree. Now there, we, you know, we have multiple models I can choose from. Whereas in the past, I, I had to try to make all these things looking at anatomy books and, you know, reference material, but to just, to be able to start with accurate, real models of patient anatomy, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it makes a big, big difference. And then to have the printers, like Christian goes home and the printer makes the mold, right? Whereas previously like that chest trainer, he had to physically do the fiberglass. He had to be here. So when you digitally design the mold, if your print bed is big enough for the mold we need, he goes home and the printer does all the work, which is another level of like increased efficiency. Yeah, the kind of things like molding uh, the collapsed lung model. I, uh, I remember at the end of that day, sending the the parts to be printed and thinking like oh i only got two molds done this afternoon and i thought that would have taken me three or four days in the past so uh, yeah it's amazing what you can accomplish once you get past the technical barriers but having that that physical back that background in the physical world and knowing how molds need to be designed to cast silicone uh that that's i think that's an important uh key is having that real world experience because uh, I think a lot of digital artists maybe are isolated to the abstract digital world and maybe don't have that experience of knowing all the things that are needed to make a physical model out of silicone or urethane or what have you. 
Yeah. I mean, it seems to me, I always thought of all of these tools and kind of the techniques to use them as kind of the tool, the toolbox or the armamentarium that you've got. And you've got kind of, a, you know, an increasing toolbox, both mm -hmm. for educational needs and then maybe for uh, for clinical needs. There's another question that came in, I think, uh, quite interesting. Just uh, can you talk to the trade off between realistic appearances and realistic mechanical properties? And assuming you're trying to achieve both, but maybe yeah. uh, if you have some thoughts on that. I'll talk a little bit about it too, Christian. Um, I think we try and solve the problem the person has. So if I have to teach you how to cannulate a vessel and you've never held a needle before, I don't need to make the fat feel like fat and the muscle layers be there and create hydrogels that have to be in the refrigerator. You know, I need to teach you how to hold a needle, put a wire in the logistical steps of uh, selling your technique for the groin for ECMO, for example. So we build to the level of hyperacuity we need. Um, and we build to the level of realism we need. We don't make hyper-realistic arms for the CRNA school to teach people arterial line access. We make a blob and, there, and with a tube in it. And the reason we do that is, well, the, the reason this exists at all is we make things that don't exist on the market are way too expensive on the market. That diet flap, if you were to cost that out and get it designed for us would be about $25,000. Um, or what's on the market is about 50 things, like a really hyper-realistic baby trainer, and we needed to do two things. So like for the arms for CRNA arterial trainers, we that costs $600 by Blue Medical. We can make that for about 20 bucks. And, and the reason we do it in-house, just like a lot of other manufacturing reasons, is we can do it faster, iterate faster and drive down cost at scale, just like point of care manufacturing does for other things. So I think like for the elbow trainer where we're trying to drain um, fluid out of a synovial joint that's stressed that you have to use ultrasound guidance, yeah, we're going for realistic feel, realistic pop into the joint, realistic fluid feeling um, and realistic ultrasound appearance. But if I just need you how to teach you how to hold an ultrasound probe and hit an olive, but we don't need all that. And it doesn't make sense to make all that. Um, let's see, I, I had a question kind of general. Uh, Christian, do you want to add to that? No, I was just going to say, uh, plus uh, they keep me pretty busy around here. So uh, <laughs> not everything needs to be hyper-realistic. Uh, <laughs> he says that, but then, but then I make something that's very basic and he goes, well, you know, they're always shooting, just like he said in his talk, they're always shooting for hyper-realism. So um, sometimes you have to say like, no, no, <laughs> Christian doesn't do this one because like he's gonna make this arm like cold stone real. Yeah, I, I thought quite interesting, uh, Jay, as you talked in your talk about the kind of the future of, edu of education and some of it being, you know, a bit of it being focused and Mayo having a focus in extended reality and using those tools to kind of drive it. I'm quite curious about kind of the interaction between between the extended reality tools and the physical 3D printed tools and kind of this whole area, because obviously the the data part of it has a lot of similarity, you know, that both both needs uh, come from needing good digital data. But maybe I'm curious if you could talk to yeah, both so education I just briefly and then maybe the clinical side of it. So we have, we have multiple arms in extended reality. We have an education arm that has to feed a really big enterprise across the highest learner, cardiothoracic surgeon, for example, down to an echo tech. And we have to build in that realm. Um, so we've been like that spine I showed, really brief. Um, it's a texture max spine from a spondylolysis case that was used for a patient, then used for orthopedic training. But we need our things, like you have a bunch of things behind you. And if you don't know what that is and you're a medical learner or trainee, they're just stuff. You need the expert knowledge to go along with the stuff. So in that spine, for example, you'll see there are QR codes that then lead to an app that then leads to an AR tracking system. So that physical thing sitting next to you all of a sudden becomes alive. And I can play video of the expert telling you what's important about this. I can anatomically label it. I can take something very basic, like the base of uh, that diet flap trainer and make an augmented reality overlap to it and start with something low cost and turn into something super high fidelity, but in the digital world. Um, the same tracking, if you really wanna do real tracking, like it's not moving when you're moving your phone, it's not jittery, it's not garbage, it's not like 
isn't this cool? Like, like Boeing really needs to track a part to put on a plane through a manufacturing engineer, right? Like those systems are expensive. Like it's not trivial to track an object. You can do it kind of crappy, but if we're gonna to go to the OR and have millimeter accuracy of guiding a screw with augmented reality into a piece of bone, there's three companies on market that have the approval. One of them is already into like $68 million of funding to get to that point. It is not trivial. So when people say I can do it, just like you know, people have been saying I can print a skull since the very first printer Scott Crumb made. But to do it at scale, to do it with machine learning segmentation algorithms, to do it cost effectively, to do it logistically, HIPAA compliant in a hospital, the I can do it doesn't translate to scale. So what we've been trying to focus on is, yes, we're building out capital equipment training, radiation safety training, anatomy, physiology, OR, augmented reality. Um, it has to live in a system and that system has to be designed and it has to be easy to scale because that spine thing is a prototype. Now, if I wanna take every 3D printed object that we make, put a QR code, track it, I need the education that goes along with it. And I have all those people. So the thing we don't need here are subject matter experts that give us everything we need to know. What, we, what we're missing is more staff. So like Christian wasn't kidding, we have, 12, we have a 12 month line to do everything in this space. We're building stuff as, Patient facing is letting a patient see themselves with mastectomy scars, all the way to teaching somebody like fibromuscular dysplasia aneurysms in the clinic. So, I mean, it's just so, but when you put an engineer, it's like when we put engineers in the surgical team, when you get a special effects engineer and a VR engineer and a 3D anatomist and a 3D rigor and lighter and engineers and radiologic data and source material, and it's all co-located, then that's where the magic happens. Because otherwise it's just, I did one. Yes, I published a paper on two, but it's not fundamentally changing the way we're gonna educate 5,000 people. Well, I wanted to, uh, to say, we're kind of getting to time here. I wanted to say thank you both for, um, for sharing your vision and your expertise. Uh, it was, this was a really exciting webinar and uh, we really appreciate you doing it. And a good day. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Do we stay on?